even though obviously transitioning exposes you to a lot more hate yeah at least you're living a life that feels truthful and honest to yourself the less you care about what other people think about you the closer you are to being who you actually are sometimes it's easy to do the thing that people are happiest with rather than what you actually want to do and that's so true for all of us you know so many people are just concerned with what their parents think Mm -hmm. or what their family think or what their partner thinks and I really wish that more people would just do what feels good for them. This episode does touch on difficult subjects, including sexual assault, racism, suicide and transphobia. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, you can contact Samaritans by calling 116-123 or you can email joe, that's J-O, at samaritans.org. You can also contact Midline Trans Plus on 0300 330 5468, a confidential support helpline for people who identify as transgender, agender, gender fluid and non-binary. Hello and welcome to Shaping Success, a brand new and very exciting podcast from Simply Be, all about women at the top of their game with me, Fleur East. As a singer and broadcaster, I'm inspired by women who push boundaries, women who have carved a different path to society's stereotypes, women who refuse to fit in. And I want to find out who and what shaped their journey to success. So in this podcast series, I'm joined by female icons from all walks of life to talk about their inspirations, heroes, and the moments that change them. We'll hear from some of the biggest female names and the ones you might know less about as they share their remarkable stories of determination and dedication and reveal the moments and icons that have shaped them along the way. Ultimately, our guests all have one thing in common. They're killing it. So let's meet them. In today's episode, we're joined by a leading figure in the worlds of fashion and social activism. A world-renowned model, she's been a bold voice helping shape the conversation around diversity on the covers of some of the world's most prestigious fashion publications. Mumro Bergdorf is a model, social activist and author whose pioneering work has helped to improve inclusivity within the fashion industry and brought trans and racial rights to the forefront of national conversations in recent years. Having been named as one of the UK's 25 most influential women in 2020, alongside Rihanna and the late Queen Elizabeth, no less. This is certainly a woman who's at the top of her game. Welcome to Shaping Success, Mumro Bergdor. Thank you. God, that was such a great introduction. Thank you. What a life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Where did it all start? Oh my you grew God. Up in Essex. I grew up in Essex, yeah. Where are you from? Walthamstow. Okay. So not far. Not far. But, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Essex in a little town called Sandstone Mount Fitcher. Uh-huh. Yeah. And not much was going on there, <laughs> especially in the way of like diversity and inclusion, which is really what I talk about a lot. So I think a lot of my work really comes from understanding what happens when you don't have that. Mm. So I think I actually became quite determined from the adversity of not seeing people around me at that time Mm. and just wanted to create the world that I wanted to see which is something that we all should do really I guess and just trying to you know be the antidote to just feeling quite isolated so I try to make a lot of my work around what would I like to have seen at that time. How did you find your voice though coming from coming from that environment and growing up in the community. I really didn't feel like I had one really a lot of the time. It's difficult because, you you know, when when you feel like you're the odd one out, Mm. you tend to feel like your opinions don't matter or that your experiences don't matter. It was a long process, I think, of slowly coming to find my people Mm. and gaining access to community. We all deserve access to community to find people who don't necessarily have to look like us, Mm. but have a common sense of the world and um, way of viewing life. I think it was just really just being around people that saw me for me. Mm. I didn't see me in like my parts, saw me in like 
the wholeness of me. And I just thought, oh, well, these are my people. And I just started being much more confident in what I wanted to talk about and how I wanted to live. And I guess my transition gave me a lot more confidence, Mm. even though obviously transitioning exposes you to a lot more hate. At least you're living a life that feels truthful and honest to yourself. And I, I mean, that's the same when, you know, someone who's gay or bi comes out. It's, you know, obviously your life gets exponentially harder in terms of how other people treat you, but you're living a life that is honest to yourself. And I think that in doing that, I was able to just be honest with myself and love myself for who I actually am. And my voice kind of came from that, I guess. Mm. You talk about like, rising above shame and giving yourself permission mm. to be who you truly are. Mm. So what is giving yourself permission? What does that look like for you? I think giving myself permission is detaching from shame mm. and connecting with yourself so that you can connect with others. Because if you don't connect with yourself, it's like RuPaul, isn't it? It's like, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else if you don't love yourself? Can I get an amen? Mm -hmm. So I think it's very that. (laughs) It's very that. It's, you know, if you can connect with yourself on a truthful level, then the way that you connect with other people and the relationships that you have with other people, you know your worth. Mm. You know what rooms are actually healthy for you. You know what love is actually love and not just lust disguised as love. So I think it's just benefited me in so many other ways. And this isn't me being like, all of you transition, everybody transition. It's it's very much like all of you live a life that is honest. And even if it isn't the general consensus or the status quo or if the government doesn't love it or if, you know, your parents aren't necessarily supportive, you need to do what's right for you. Now, I understand that you start transitioning in your early 20s. Yeah, right? about it's it's difficult because like mm. I started medically transitioning when I was 23, 24. Okay. I started at 23 and then I freaked out because I, there was so much going on in my life and I was like, I can't handle all of this change right now and then started again at 24. So which is like completely normal. Mm. In terms of like socially transitioning and dressing yeah. how I wanted to, that was really from the age of like 16 in private. Okay. And then 19 when I moved out to go to university so really I've kind of always I mean I probably would have identified as non-binary at the time Mm -hmm. um, just because I didn't really see myself within the gender binary Mm -hmm. and then became much more I guess binary thinking for my sins because Mm -hmm. god knows I, I really think that gender in a lot of ways is quite restricting and I really admire the non-binary community for you know having the strength to explore life outside of the binary I think it's it's incredible and something that we should all draw power from but yeah so I guess 23 24 but the thing is I understand that what you said you said it's completely normal that you then went oh no actually I'm gonna I'm gonna put this on pause because a lot in a I mean in so many ways and you'll know this way more than me but in a lot of ways to go outside of the norm, that's the hard path. Mm. You know, the easy path yeah. is to conform, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. It was extremely difficult. I mean, I I was sexually assaulted as soon, pretty much as soon as I started living authentically. Mm. And I think when that happened, it really just pushed me back. And all of the confidence that I had summoned to be myself was stripped away from me so once I could separate the assault from Mm. being myself and understanding that I didn't bring that on myself then I started making the steps to live life on my own terms but it was a really rough time at you know in those moments it's such a shame that people can have that power over other people and it was a really big lesson because you you really never know what anyone else is going through. And the idea of someone poking fun at somebody in the street and taking away that person's agency Mm. is just something that is just so obscene to me because I know what it's like to feel like that. And like, 
in the early days of my transition, I'd have like people spitting on me in the street. Oh my and, gosh. you know, I worked in an ice cream store for a very, I know, it's kind of like an ice, like a frozen yogurt store. Mm. And people would refuse to be served by me because they didn't want to be served by a trans person. Oh it was like just so nuts. Like, and for what reason? It doesn't make any sense. Well, no, there is no logic to that. There's no logic to it, but there's no logic to any of it. I want to get into all the moments that have shaped you because I cannot wait to delve into it all. Yeah. But the first thing I want to ask is, what did it feel like the moment that you finally accepted your truth and started to give yourself permission to just live freely as mm. who you authentically are? What did that feel like? I guess when I first moved to university in Brighton, I come from a very conservative town, not necessarily conservative voting, but mm. conservative mindset, very traditional. I didn't have the space to be myself. Like I couldn't have just walked down the street in a pair of heels or mm. like had grown my hair out how I wanted to. So as soon as I went to university, I was adamant that that's exactly what I was going to do. Mm. And I guess it was one of the first nights out at university and I wore heels for the first time. And it wasn't even that they were like a fab pair of heels. It was just that I just wanted to be closer to who I yeah. wanted to be. And yeah, I just felt very uncensored. Mm. And I think it was that feeling of uncensorship that I've always referred to and understood that the less you care about what other people think about you, yeah the closer you are to being who you actually are. And it's such a simple thing, mm -hmm. but I feel like especially, you know, in especially in this industry, like you're confronted with your image so much yeah. Oh, yeah. that sometimes it's easy to do the thing that people are happiest with rather than what you actually want to do. And that's so true for all of us. You know, so many people are just concerned with what their parents think mm -hmm. or what their family think or what their partner thinks. And I really wish that more people would just do what feels good for them. That's so true. I love that. That's very empowering. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this would hear that and go, oh, yeah, I do that. Like we I'm all living do for, that. We'll, we all do, yeah. Mm. We all do, even without realising. Mm. We might not actually And I guess that's why that. I was like writing the book, like in one way or another, we all transition because we all have that process mm. of getting closer to who we actually are. And for trans people, it's to do with our gender identity. But we all have that journey to make. And the sooner that we all do it, the sooner we can all be happier. Yeah, it's like a universal journey that we're all on. And I think when we understand the one thing that unites us rather than what separates us, I mm. think we'll be on on the right path. I, I think, think so. Um, you do so many things. Like you've done I'm fashion exhausted, PR, babe. DJ, <laughs> LGBTQ plus activist. Thanks. It seems like as well, the more authentic you've been, mm. the more opportunities and doors have opened for you. Have you found that it's getting easier as you're progressing? It doesn't your get easier. Mm. I feel like it... It becomes more fulfilling because the more that you do it, the more you understand what you bring to the rooms that you're in. Okay. Yeah. And the less you feel like an imposter. You know, like when you first start doing something new, you're almost second guessing whether or not you deserve to be yeah. there. Yeah. And the longer you're there, you're like, okay, well, I know what I'm bringing to the table. So it becomes easier in that respect. But then obviously... The further up the ladder you get, the more work you get and the more responsibility you have, mm. especially to, you know, I have a big responsibility to my community because yeah. a lot of trans people don't get opportunities. So everything that I do, I want to relate back to my community to make sure that is it empowering? Is it informative? Is it going to push the needle forward for my community if I can? Mm. Those kind of things. So I've always got it in the back of my head. So the responsibility increases and the workload increases, but mm. it does get easier a little bit because I know how to do things and I don't feel like I need to, you know, second guess myself or have that internal panic or am I good enough or that kind of thing. So, mm. yeah, I think the the feeling of going into a situation and bossing it is there more often which is good because yeah. you want that feeling of knowing that you're good at what you do i love that i'm walking in and having that confidence like yeah, yeah. i want to talk about the moment that probably most people know you for 
the moment that kind What's of catapulted that? you. So in 2017, <laughs> you became the face of the UK L'Oreal yeah. campaign, mm -hmm. being the first transgender model mm -hmm. for L'Oreal. And it was epic. I'll never forget it. Everyone was like, whoa, this is major. And then subsequently after, you were dropped, but you backed yourself. And now, fast forward, you're on their board, mm. the advisory board for inclusion and diversity. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that situation because, whoa, what I'm going to like really condense it because it's been quite a wild ride. Mm. Ultimately, I don't believe in just being at loggerheads with people that you have had conflict with. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to try and find a resolve if you can. And I'm also aware that people make mistakes, companies make mistakes, and we all have a process of being, you know, of becoming better people or becoming better entities, or becoming more inclusive. And as an activist, I feel like obviously that situation happened and it was messy as hell mm -hmm. and it was not good for my spirit and it wasn't good for our community. But I do feel like loads of conversations happened from it. And maybe it did get people talking about race in a much more confrontational way that was necessary. Mm. It happened just after one of the most traumatic experiences within our culture, which was probably the 2016 election. I think that that uprooted a lot mm. of hate. Mm. But it was kind of sandwiched in between the 2016 election, the Charlottesville riots, and the George Floyd protests. And yeah. I feel like in that time, we've really come a long way in not only how we talk about race, but especially within the entertainment industry, how people understand race functioning in a systemic way. And even if you look at the industry now, it is so different. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. The opportunity that is there now because people are aware of the issues is so different. You know, we have so many girls of color, especially, you know, in the mainstream now. We have people being able to talk about their experiences in a way where they're not being chastised or punished for. Mm. Certain language is being, you know, called out way past due time. And I think it's unfortunate now that we're seeing a pushback against wokeness mm. because people don't like that change or people feel like that change is robbing them of, you know, the life that they once had. And times have massively changed since then. But um, I do feel like even as turbulent as it was, it was great to find a resolve for L'Oreal and to be included in their diversity and inclusion board. Because ultimately, if you've only got people on a board that agree with everything that you say, then there's not really an effective well, board. Well, yeah, there's no conversation, is there? Yeah. There's no debate. Mm. And I think it's a good move to have people who are essentially your, have being your critics to come in and to talk about how you can actually improve things. I think that that's what all companies should do. What other moments have happened like behind the scenes that we haven't seen? Like, is there a positive moment that's happened in your life that has helped shape you? Yeah, so many. So many. And that's the problem, one. isn't it? It's like, you know, the 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 negative things often get so much more airtime yeah. than, than than the positive things. But yeah, I've got so much love in my life. I've got so many amazing people in my life. I'm a tr such a believer of, you know, that it really takes a village mm. and none of us are self-made. We've all got an incredible team behind us yeah. who encourage us and support us and keep us going. But I'm just really inspired by a lot of the people in my life. And I think that that's really such an important way to live your life. I think it's such a shame when people are like friends with people who they aren't really friends with. Mm. And people are in relationships with people who they don't really love. I think it's really important to curate your life with people that inspire you, people that uplift you, people that call you out and make you a better person. Mm. So that's just really how I tend to live my life. Who really. inspires you? What? Who are those people in your life? I think one of the most inspiring people in my life is probably Edward Enenfall, mm. the editor of British Vogue. He has really taught me to dream big, to 
make the most out of the situations that I'm in, believe in myself, be creative with how I get my message across. Mm -hmm. And he's given me so many incredible opportunities uh, with Vogue and and beyond and just supported me as a friend and as a mentor. And his journey is just so inspiring, you know, for a black gay man who is also a refugee to be one of the most influential and powerful men in not only the British fashion industry, but the world is incredible. And reading his book, I learned so many things I didn't even know about him. And it just inspired me and made me really, truly believe that whatever I want to achieve, I can. And some of his pep talks just really keep me going. And every now and again, he sends me like a fun dog meme that, <laughs> that, like, that one friend. at the exact moment that I need it it's it's quite he's got a very good sixth he's sense like spiritually in tune yeah yeah, yeah yeah he's he's such an amazing person and I'm I'm so glad that we met that's so cool that you have someone like that in your life like in your phone book just like cash yeah like what yeah he's amazing what about anybody else like growing up in particular? Were there any icons you had that you were just like, oh my gosh, like admiring from afar? I had loads of icons. I was really obsessed with a lot of a lot of celebrities, but I actually wanted to talk about my university lecturer. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Because I wasn't very happy when I was at university. Coming out of the town that I grew up in, I felt very isolated throughout my whole childhood. So I came to university super happy that I was leaving the town but also quite depressed Mm. and I developed an eating disorder and I was also like going through a lot in terms of my gender identity but my university lecturer my creative writing lecturer specifically really taught me to take all of that pain that I was feeling and put it into the work that I was meant to be doing Mm. (laughs) rather than see it as two separate things or like a reason why I couldn't do my work And I just don't think that I would have been able to write my book without the lessons that she taught me. There's so many conversations going on right now about how to crush the spirit of young people. Mm. It's not about how can we encourage trans kids? How can we encourage queer Mm. kids? Because, you know, every single trans adult was once a trans kid every single queer person was once a queer kid Mm. so I think it's really you know the conversation is all wrong and she was such a great example of seeing the thing that made me different and encouraging me to be that Mm. rather than me be ashamed of that and as soon as I felt like I had an adult in my corner who saw me and was like right that's magical Let's encourage it. Yeah. Let's grow it. Let's celebrate it rather than don't be that. Mm. And that's all that I'd really had up until that point. And I really started to blossom. And my work improved, my grades improved, my health improved. So I guess she was such a great example of not only how to be a effective teacher, but really how we should all be treating each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just meeting each other where we're at and understanding that there's an incredibly complex backstory to every single person. You've got some really positive people in your life, which is amazing. I do, I do. Mm -hmm. I've got an incredible partner. I've got a great set of friends, great team behind me. And um, yeah, I feel very supported and loved, which is great because it's obviously not a given. No, no, it's really not. Is there a memory that you have that comes to mind that was like something you'd say such a positive memory or moment in your in your life's journey that kind of made you, gave you the resilience that you have or made you who you are? Like me and my parents didn't have a very positive relationship when I was growing up. And it, was, it wasn't really until I got given an honorary doctorate from my old university that they really were proud of me. Wow. 
<laughs> wow. Obviously, and like I'm sure that they were that? proud of me. How old was that? were you when that happened? I got it in 2018. Okay. So so quite recently, but like it, it's not that I've never seen them proud of me. I think it was the first time that I saw them proud of me as myself. Yes. And okay. I think that up until that point, they were like always very worried about my life in the public eye or my life as a trans woman or my life as a queer person that it often overshadowed, you know, their obvious sense of pride for me. Um, but it was, I think it was that moment of seeing like people give me a standing ovation after my speech and coming to understand what, I, what I'm actually doing with my life. <laughs> so I think, it was, <laughs> yeah. I think it was that moment for them. I think that was a really nice moment as a family. But I don't know, I think I'm constantly having those kind of moments where it's like a reminder of that I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. I try to make sure that I have those moments once a day and in every single experience of adversity, you know, when something doesn't go my way or if something doesn't happen in the way that I wanted it to, or if I feel like a situation is an anticlimax or a letdown, I try to not sit in that feeling and take the lesson from it. Okay, I'm not going to allow that to happen again. Mm. Or why am I feeling this way? How can I pull that apart and understand what is actually lying underneath it? Like those kind of things, rather than just being upset. I, I find that that's such a wasted emotion because what are you going to do with being upset? It doesn't, it doesn't can't change do anything. anything. Or anything. Like, of course you feel it, mm. but take something from it. Don't just sit and wallow. And I think, you know, I wallowed for a long time. I wallowed for many years and it doesn't really get you anywhere. It just kind of like feeds a cycle of self-pity, which, you know, we've all got one day of feeling that and then try to turn it into something because that's what you deserve, I mm. feel. I feel like... If you're just constantly beaten down and then you're 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 not doing anything with it, it robs you of your life. So I really just try to take positive from negative every single day. Yeah, I think it'd be really beneficial to know if you can think of an example. I mean, I'm sure there've been so many challenging moments, mm. but because you have such a positive mindset, I'd love to hear of a time where you faced like something really challenging, yeah, or faced adversity and you and you managed to turn it around. I'll share something personal. Last year, my ex-girlfriend passed away. Mm -hmm. um, she took her own life. And I was actually also in a place where it was extremely dark. I, I was not having a good year last year. Mm -hmm. Everyone's life is like that. And mine was... <laughs> there I felt very overwhelmed with work and stressed and I wasn't balancing life very well mm -hmm. I felt the responsibility on my shoulders to get things right was really crushing and I just felt like I was on a treadmill of work 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 and trying to have a personal life but not managing it yeah and I just didn't feel like there was anything left I felt like everything had been taken from me and I was just constantly trying to find you know my life force and luckily you know I've got an amazing partner who really helped me through it but as I was really on the floor I got a message from a friend to tell me that my ex-partner had taken her own life and I think losing a loved one to suicide is the hardest thing because obviously there's no goodbye mm. and there's no understanding a suicidal mindset because if you did then you would also be suicidal the idea of not being able to live is just so hard to comprehend. Mm. But it's also well in the comprehension as well. You know, you realize how precious life is. Mm. And I feel like it really shook me away a little bit and made me understand how precious my own life is 
and how precious the life of other people in my life and how precious the life of all people is and are. So I guess that's an example of trying to find a positive in every single situation, even if it is as bleak Mm. as losing someone that you love, that it can be a reminder to live your life and that you've only got one. Mm. You've got one shot. And you can't allow other people to dictate how you live it. You need to live it now. Like, not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Not next year. Not next month. Happiness isn't there. Mm. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's like in here. In there. I think it's a really freeing feeling to know that somewhere in here is the happiness. Yeah. And you carry it with you. And... When bad things happen, you need to find it. You can't run towards something because it's never going to be there. I can definitely relate to that in a sense because my father passed away in 2020. And I remember thinking, oh no, like how is this going to impact me as a person? I can go one of two ways. This can make me a really bitter person. Mm -hmm. And I can think life is so unfair Mm -hmm. and, you know, get really angry and get really down. Or I can kind of look back on the amazing times that I had with him and be grateful that I had such an amazing yeah. father. Yeah. But then also, like you said, you then have that moment of, oh, tomorrow really isn't promised. Yeah. And I know people say these sayings, tomorrow isn't promised. Yeah. Today is a gift. Like you kind of say those things like you flippantly. Really start to when you understand it, whoo, it's a different level. So yeah. like hundred percent understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's so tough. And I've spoken about it a little bit, not much, but you really start living for you and the person that you've lost Mm. when you lose someone. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to carry you with me. It's like that Maya Angelou quote when she's talking about going up on stage and she's going to take every single person who's ever shown her kindness up there with her all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life. And like, sadly, like I have lost a fair amount of people to quite tragic means such as, you know, suicide or drug overdoses or, you know, murder. It's, it's been a real ride. (laughs) Wow. And you, start to really feel like you carry people with you because otherwise it's a really difficult thing to deal with. But you do carry people with you, you know? You you carry the experiences and the lessons and the love that they showed you. Yeah. Because that's all that we can give to each other. We are literally just reflections. And, you know, I, I just try to meet people with as much, like, energy as I can muster <laughs> <laughs> and try to be that person that they can carry with them if you know they're str- if they're struggling I love that the idea of carrying people with you I've never heard it put that way but I love that image mm. like I feel, feel that really comforting actually like when you said it like that yeah. you've done so much in your career you've got to wear like the biggest designers you've graced the covers of magazines like fashion's a big part of your life And I want to ask you, how has it helped you in really finding who you are? Because fashion is such a self-expression, isn't it? Like to some people, they'll just see it's just clothes. Mm. To others, it's like, no, this is like my identity. Like, How has your style helped empower you along your journey? Mm. Well, I mean, for anyone that thinks that fashion is just clothes, I think that they need to think again. Because (laughs) what other industry are women, gay men, and trans people calling the shots in, Mm, you know? That's very true. Women, gay men, and trans people are literally shaping culture through fashion. And that is no mean feat. Mm. You know, women make more money than men in fashion. (laughs) Yeah. Female models make more money than men, for starters. And it's not all about money, no. but in terms of calling the shots also, women 
are calling the shots too. And I think that that is an incredible thing, not only from like a perspective of business, but also like in terms of how, I won't give you the whole speech, the Miranda Priestley. I was going to say, I feel it coming on, (laughs) Double Wears Prada. From a pile of stuff. (laughs) Um, But it's very that, you know, fashion really infiltrates all culture. It's an extremely valuable tool in how we can have conversations, how people understand people's stories. You know, that's what we're doing today. You know, fashion is a great platform in order for us to question things, to push society's envelope. And um, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's an incredible space that has allowed me to be myself. That has inspired me. I think that fashion is a window to a world that doesn't exist yet. Mm. We see fantastical imaginings of the world and how it could be. We lead with equity rather than necessarily a reflection of the way that the world is. Sometimes it's a better world. Mm. Sometimes it's a reflection of our despair in terms of the creativity, a lot of what Alexander McQueen did, for instance, was really, you know, talking about a lot of the rage that women feel, um, but also extremely empowering. Looking back at who inspired me growing up, it was Naomi Campbell, it was Kate Moss, it was Karen Nelson, it was Isabella Blow, it was Anna Wintour, Mm. it was like all of these strong women. And not only that, but like also it was like women like Britney, it was women like Beyonce, (laughs) it was women like Madonna who used fashion as a way to emphasize how strong and defiant they were yeah. of the culture that they lived in. It was like Jerry Halliwell's Union Jack dress. <laughs> it was Mel B head to toe and leopard print. Yeah. It's the expression of someone's womanhood that really in- encouraged me to express my own. So if there was a life with no fashion, I would be extremely heartbroken. <laughs> it's like a life with no gay man. I would be like, <laughs> What are we doing here? What would the world be? (laughs) What would the world be? It would be decidedly less interesting. (laughs) Do you know, I love that you said that and you've expressed how much you love fashion because it kind of links back to the story you told me earlier that the moment you felt like you stepped into who you were was when you were in uni and you put those heels on. Yeah. And you went out, it was like you put on a pair of shoes and that was like the moment that you felt like you yeah. were, you had a And it sounds so silly, but it's not even about the shoes. No. It's about doing what I wanted to do and like going against what I was told I should do. And, you know, it's I don't get that feeling now every time I put a pair of heels on. So it wasn't <laughs> even about the heels. It was, it was literally about being truthful to myself. And fashion was a gateway into me being able to be truthful about myself. And, you know, what other industry do you see uplifting trans people right now? There are none really. Outside of the months of pride, we really don't see that many industries celebrating trans people. Increasingly so, Mm. but like not necessarily in a way that is so visible and so visually empowering. So to know that trans people young trans people have an industry that they can look at and feel empowered and feel like anything is possible, that there is a space for me, that I can work towards something, that I can be the something that I'm working towards. That's so important. Mm. And um, I love the industry for that. And I love the opportunities that it's gotten for me. And I love that it's such a community. We all really look out for each other and build each other up. It's such a a place as well, like I said, that you can express yourself mm-hmm. and you can actually make a statement mm. with an outfit. And I know a lot of the time people are quite scared or anxious to be bold mm-hmm. like, with what they wear. Like, oh they're kind of like, the me. amount of times I've heard <laughs> people say, oh, I can't wear that because, oh, no, 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 I can't I wear that know. color. Or, no, I can't do that because I'm X, fill in the blank. I feel like there's a lot of fear around dressing that really needs to go, like, especially... Like with weddings, like people are like, you can't outdress the bride. Yeah. And it's like, listen, for, <laughs> for my wedding, <laughs> on the invite, it will say, you can try outdress the bride. 
And then in an the asterisk at the bottom, you will not succeed. <laughs> But you can try. And I want you to try because I want everyone to be living their best life, dressed to the nines. Yes. Outdress the bride at all times. What is the next thing that you want to disrupt? Because I feel like as an activist, you've got, you've probably got so many plans of the way you want to see things, the next thing you want to tackle. What's the next thing you're going to disrupt? What are you going to shape for the future generations? I think it's really about encouraging youth to be the disruptors mm. and to have the confidence to change things that they want to see change. So I think it's really about empowering them to disrupt and passing the baton on, you know, I've got so many young trans people that look up to me now and I'm so honored. I mean, it's not honor at this point. At the beginning of my career, I was kind of like, don't look up to me. I'm not your role model. <laughs> like I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like now I feel like it's one I embrace. So I really just want young people to identify what they don't like and change it and understand that they have the power to change it. And even if it doesn't feel like it's changing at the time, change isn't obvious. It's not like, boom, we're mm. in a different reality. It happens very, very slowly. It's a transition. And sometimes it isn't you that makes the change, but it's you that gets the ball rolling. So what we're doing now in terms of a community, as the trans community, we probably won't see significant change to our community for a very long time to the point where we are experiencing an equality mm -hmm. in the same way that the gay community has achieved. You know, it's taken 50 something years since the first Pride to get to where we are now. Yeah, And the trans community is navigating an environment that is reminiscent of where the gay community was in the 1980s slash 1990s. Mm -hmm. So we've got a long way to go. But I think what we need to see it as is a relay race rather than a sprint. Mm. We're probably not going to be the ones to cross the finish line, but we are on the way. And it's just a real honor to be the one disrupting things and, you know, annoying the, <laughs> the government and inspiring young people because that's what needs to happen. We need a tomorrow where people feel like they can just be themselves and walk down the street without fear. And also, more importantly, we need to stop fearing each other because there is nothing to fear. It's all about coexisting rather than clambering for power. Oh, you just talk in like iconic quote. Cryptic. That's like your language. <laughs> Thank your you. Language. No, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, I literally just want to have a better world. And I think that that's something that we all are actually trying to bring into existence in one way or another. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's hopefully in our reach. It's honestly been so incredible to talk to you and learn about all the moments that have shaped you. If anyone wants to follow you, what are your handles on socials? <laughs> <laughs> I only really use Instagram. Mm -hmm. So it's at Munro Bergdorf. Um, that's M-U-N-R-O-E Bergdorf, B-E-R-G-D-O-R-F. Yes, we will find and threads. you. I'm loving threads. Oh, threads is great, isn't follow it? Follow me for random thoughts. Great. Yeah, I'll be getting on that now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks, babe. So lovely Love to see you. Thanks for listening to Shaping Success, a Simply Be podcast. If you like what you've heard, please give us a follow and a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Shaping Success is a Folding Pocket production. <laughs>